Good day, my videographer friends. Now, we spoke last week about creating content and how creating content can make you an authority and attract people to want to do business with you rather than chasing them um, to, to try and engage them in some kind of conversation to do business. But creating content at scale takes some systems. And my guest today, Stephen G. Pope, who has amassed an enormous following on TikTok and is using content across all social media platforms, has built this technology, a system that he's going to share with you today how it works and how it is able to take one piece of content and distribute it across different platforms. We also go into what that looks like in terms of a process and there are four stages and then what kind of size team do you need to be able to pull this off. Now I know you might be thinking but then you know I, I'm, I don't want to be building a team for, for creating content but I want you to think about this and um, once you run out of friends, family and anyone foolish enough to get close to you to sell to you've got to go out to a cold audience and there's two or three ways you can do that one is running ads two is going to networking events and three is to make content in an ideal world some of all some and all of that can be achieved with creating content so dig into this episode Stephen is an absolute authority i think you'll find a, a ton of value in this enjoy Stephen. um Thanks for, for coming back and and um, and we just split this this conversation up because I want to move from the, the conversation we had last week about creating content and some of the ideas behind that to doing it at scale. How, how do you take because because it's very it's very labor intensive or it can be labor intensive to create content and start posting at different platforms. And you mentioned last week about the difference between a networking platform like LinkedIn and maybe a scale platform like TikTok and I suppose TikTok is a good place to start before we just get into the mechanics of how you as an engineer have have created a system for how to deliver this kind of content but I until I met you I was like you know TikTok schmickmock you know it's like <laughs> it's it's for the kids and I yeah. think that's something that um maybe a lot of people um think of yeah, for sure. Tell me, tell me about your journey with TikTok and why why that platform and what what you see the value to be. Yeah, so even like last in the last uh, last week when we were talking, I mentioned how I, I had seen Gary V and he was the prompt to get me on video in the first place, and uh, then I I heard this rumbling of TikTok and then I was like, oh yeah, okay, that's a new platform. And then Gary V was like, you should get on there, and I was like, well, I listened to him the last time and it worked. And then there, here's another thing is that when I first got onto LinkedIn, that was my first platform. Um, I had seen a bunch of people that had been there for like years and solely because of that, they had built big audiences and were monetizing them. And so I was like, and just, you're always kind of, you know, just like, man, I wish I had done that. Right. So I saw that opportunity on Facebook or on uh, TikTok, And then there were times like, it was like 2020, I was just like scanning it. And I was like, oh, wait, if I'm like, I'm like my customer, like if I'm here, they're here, maybe like, maybe I'm early, but they're here too. And so if it's just content and it's just my video showing up, if I'm saying something relevant to them, like, it doesn't matter, like whether they came there to see whatever they came to see, like it's now me and I'm saying something that's relevant to them. And I call them out. I'm like, Hey, are you, are you this? Are you this? Do you want to do this? Right? Right out of the gate. So I'm not like, Hey, St Hey, I'm Stephen Pope. Let me tell you a little story. Like I just, you call the person out. So like when they're flipping through, so that was my, that was me. I was just like, and I was like, Hey, and I've been doing a bunch of video on LinkedIn. I think I could probably be pretty good at this. So I jumped on there and it was just like one of the best decisions I ever made. Cause it's like, that's my primary lead source at this point. All, all like mature business owners. Like, I don't have any kids as clients. Yeah, I think that's the thing that's 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 enlightening for me, is it may have started as kids doing crazy dances, but it's evolved. And we think back to YouTube ten years ago. It was you know we we used to kind of sniffle at it and say oh it's you know it's where people put funny cat videos. Now it's uh it's my main source of entertainment and education. Right, I, right. I want to learn anything. I don't even Google stuff anymore. I go straight to YouTube. So I think that that point about, 
you know, trusting sources that have been reliable in the past, like we've both been fans of Gary Vee and, and we've taken on his advice and it's worked and getting in early. Are, are we still in the early stages of TikTok in, in your opinion? I think so, yeah. And here's the other thing about TikTok that people don't understand as well is that most of these other platforms are social graphs. So it's based off of who you're connected to. And so like if you have more followers on Instagram, you get more views. Same with LinkedIn. TikTok is an interest graph. So the algorithm is based off of what you find interesting. So as it learns what you like to look at, it's looking for content to feed it to you. And you could, so if you happen to jump on the platform and create something that's interesting to enough people, it'll just, you could have three followers and it would show it to a million people. I mean, it's, it had to have like, they had to have watched it, but it will scale it out that way. So they'll show it to 10 people, then a hundred, then a thousand, then 10,000. So that's the way their algorithm works. Um, so yeah, I think it's early and I think it will be like that for a long time because that's their competitive advantage, right? They're the place you go to, to have instant growth. And now you see all the other platforms trying to copy them. So um, I don't really have any uh, doubt that it'll, I think it will be like, I think the competition for the good, this is where it's interesting, right? The competition for creating good content will go up there, right? But it won't, I don't think it will always, I think it, they'll continue to, to base it off of how good the content is. So it's more of a race of who's the, who's going to be the best creator versus who's going to amass the biggest following. And, and, you know, one of the, I guess, um, just from my own perspective is, is, is looking at TikTok and thinking, well, I can take a piece of content. I can write a piece of content very quickly on LinkedIn, or I can record a video, upload it, write a few words and it's done. With TikTok, I'm seeing, you know, I mean, it's, it's all nine by 16, uh, um, right. nine by 16. So it's all vertical. Um, but I see these graphics and emojis. Is, is that yeah. something that you have to do on TikTok? No. Is, is that, is that something that, why, why do people do that? What, what is, is it, is it, is it, uh, is that stylistic thing? Well, it does, it does help. So like, these are all like, I, I, what I like to tell people is like, if you try to achieve all that in the beginning, it can be overwhelming. So I just, those are all micro improvements that you can make. Right. So if you get, if you just get on camera and go, right. Uh, there are a lot of tools that will make that stuff easier. And the more little things that are popping up and keeping people's interest, but, you know, it's probably going algorithmically, it probably will help. But the, the, the main currency is still the good content, right? So I think people have to keep a perspective. It's like, what's going to get you the biggest bang for the buck at your current level? It's not going to be all the emojis and stuff. Like you put a bunch of emojis on like uh, a bunch, like a really bad video. It's not going to help it. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So you have yeah. to just, you have to have the sense and the awareness to like prioritize what you need to do. And if, if you've never made a video, well, you got to make a good video first. And then if you get good at that, then you can sprinkle in all that stuff because you've probably seen like, like somebody where it's like a re they're, they're really awkward on camera, but like all the bells and whistles are there, and it, it's almost kind of like, wait a minute, this, some. <laughs> well, is that you can't polish a turd, right? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so, something's not quite right here. Like, the the video quality is off the charts, but like this person can't like say a word yet. So like, pri it's just priorities. And how do you, as someone like who's just starting out, I mean, I, I'm pretty comfortable just getting on camera and, and, and talking and uploading. How do you, how do you get discovered on TikTok? How does, how does your content on the, the topic that you're specializing in get in front of the right audience? Is, is it a question of hashtags? Do you, how, how do you, how do you get that content the, in front the, of people? Or is it, is it analyzing the content and kind of transcribing it and then pushing it out to, to the audience? it's more about like who ends up watching it. Right. And so how do you get the right person to watch it? Like you, you call them out. Right. Uh, so it's just like, are you a plumber? Well, like plumbers are going to stop for at least the second. Yeah. Time. Are you a consultant? Are you a, are you a six figure consultant? Are you mm. a seven figure consultant? You know, so like you just target it right with your words and like, 
the watch time is going to be their algorithm is good enough. It's going to start to like, it's going to, they, I, I'm, their algorithm is going to put you in a pool, you know, and like start to learn yes. how to do that. So it's literally just calling these people out. I mean, there's probably like hashtags and other things, but I think those are like secondary. So like, if you, you, you asked me if I'm starting out, starting out priority, call the person out. Who are you talking to? Do you want to make a million dollars? Do you want to make $10 million? If you make $10 million and I said, do you want to make a million? If you already make a million, you're not going to watch because you're like, I already do that. Right? Yeah, right. Right. Interesting. So now let, let's move on to, you know, so we, we, now we've got, we've got a bit of an insight to TikTok. Most of us, I think, understand how LinkedIn works. But, but what impressed me is, is how omnipresent you are um, across all channels and and you were sharing with me how you do that i wonder if you might um talk a little bit about and i guess it's where your, your engineering and backgrounds and how do you how do you build this to work <laughs> at scale yeah. without employing 10 people yeah and um so mentally you want to you want to break it down by the creation process the repurposing process and the distribution process and then your team. So there's like four things. And regardless of you're using technology, you want to optimize those four things regardless, right? Like with systems and frameworks, even if you're doing it on a piece of paper, like at each one of those phases, you want to have it dialed in. Uh, so if I go on a podcast or, or cause you want to make the content creation process easy, you want to, you want to be able to record easily and you want that content to be positioned in such a way that it can be repurposed very easily. So sometimes people start, start a podcast and they find themselves not talking a lot. Well, that's not going to make it easy for you to make clips from it. So number one, just theoretically and like practically the recording process has to be simple and thoughtful. And like, I'm sure you're the same. I think you even showed it to me, but I just hit one button and the whole thing pops on. Right. Yeah. So little things like that. Um, yeah. And then what happens as I start to step through this, if I start to then layer on the engineering technology part is that right after the creation process is done, it's recorded. Like you want to start to be able to keep everything really tightly organized. And so for me, the way I did that is that as soon as I have any kind of recording, whether it's a, a video or a collection of videos, like a folder of videos, I drop it into Google drive and my system pulls that in immediately gives it an ID. It creates all the folders and the structure around that. Um, and then essentially it's a row in a database. The database happens to be Airtable. So right out of the gate right now, I'm like, I just finished recording and now I have a, a way to now facilitate the organization of whatever's going to happen. And there's a bunch of things that will happen, but like now I'm, I'm just, in the best place possible. Whereas like a lot of people, cause here's what happens. If you don't do that, you're, you're, you're either going to do all that manually. And most people will just give up on that at, at some point they'll get lazy. Um, and so then all the other processes down the line start to break down. Um, or you, or you do that, but you just don't have it quite as systematized. So you can't do all the, like the really cool things like in that same process, all I'll grab the metadata around the video, like width and height and uh, all those things, which I can do more interesting things with, but that's the beginning of the creation process. And then whether or not you have questions here, I can kind of just continue to go down that, those other four kind of pillars of the content creation process. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is interesting because, you know, for, for filmmakers who are watching this or listening to this, they're used to creating content and they've got certain post-production workflows right. for the client work they do. I've seen but those. I think and I... It's really helpful to understand the steps that you're, you're implementing to be omnipresent. Yeah. And I've seen those too. Like I've, I've, I'm connected with several videographers and photographers solely because they showed me like, they're like, here's what you do. And they create all these folders. And I'm like, that's what I do, but I do it automatically. Um, yeah. So, so then, then the next piece is like, okay, so now that it's categorized, now we go into repurposing. So 
where a lot of people go wrong is that because they don't have it systemized, because when they created the content, they didn't really think about how is this going to get repurposed. It's like every time the, the next video comes, it's like, okay, now what do we do with it? And so they're always reinventing the wheel. And so what ends up happening is they have this big, they have, sometimes people can realize I've got 40 videos that I've never done anything with. And that's what happens, yeah. right? Because you never had a system to like, okay, what are we literally going to do with this? Because as soon as a video comes in, you want to attack it and get it done and get it out the door, or you just develop this backlog that never gets touched. So I developed this concept of a playbook, which is with this type of content, if it's a podcast, what are all the things that need to get done? Like in, in, in great detail, like, okay, I'm going to send it to my newsletter. I'm going to publish it to YouTube. I mean, when I say it out loud, it sounds very simple, but like just making sure that you're outlining these things. Uh, and then like, so for instance, like if I do a YouTube video, I'll turn it into a square for LinkedIn because LinkedIn is a square platform. So I've got a guideline that tells my video editor what to do. And he's got to like, he's got to think a little bit when he does that. Right. Because something might be off on the, the side. Yeah. Right. So it's articulating in great detail what needs to happen. It's like a playbook, right? Like this happened now, let's run the play on this and execute all of these as tasks. And what are in, in granular detail, what needs to happen? Uh, and so my system will create, essentially will create all those tasks from that and will give places for people to put this content when it's ready. So it's, it's creating the little container and telling somebody exactly where to put the, where to put the video and the, con like, so like my video editor doesn't have to think he's like, Oh, I need that square video. And when I'm done with it, I'm going to drop it right here. And that's, and it removes the ambiguity. So in this, for, for anyone who's watching this, um, when it's on YouTube, we're recording this in a 16 by nine frame side by side to turn this into a square. There's a number of ways you can do that. And what you right. don't want to do is have an editor say, well, I'll do it the way I think I would do it. <laughs> you want to have a system that says, this is how we do things around here. So you've got that consistency. Yeah. And, the, and like the ambiguity is the biggest thing, right? Because you don't like the ambiguity is a rock in your shoe. That's the best way I can put it. And you're not going to go hiking if you have a rock in your shoe. So if, if you want to have a tight process where your, your podcast is going out every week and then a bunch of things happen in between that, you can't have like a thousand rocks in your shoe. So the ambiguity is a deal breaker in your, in your flow, because people are just going to get annoyed. Like you're going to email your editor and you're, and you're going to be like, Hey, you sh you were supposed to put it in this folder. And he'll be like, you didn't tell me that. And you'll be like, yeah, I did. I told you that. Yeah. And then he's getting annoyed at you because you're kind of just being annoying. Like you may, maybe you did tell him that, but like, it's not reasonable to think that people are going to perform in this <laughs> like high performance workflow if it's not a high performing workflow. Right? So I've been in that process with my video editor a million times where I was like, dude, I, I told you like, you're supposed to do it like this. And so instead of getting mad at him, I was like, well, I'm just going to design this so that never happens again and yeah. make it so dead simple for him that he actually enjoys working with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because cause you, if you have a good editor, you don't want to lose them because you're trying to scale to like the moon. Right. Uh, that's right. It's your job. Not only you're, you, you want a bunch of content, but you also want people to enjoy working with you. So it's like, yeah. it's like optimizing this flow is like how you're actually going to achieve that level of scale without going mad yourself and without pissing everybody off on your team. And, 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 if, and, if, and in every um, engagement situation with a team member, when there's a problem of which there are always countless, um, right. you blame the system, not the person, because as the business owner and the extreme ownership, embracing that notion that it's all on us, yeah. is that we haven't, you know, sometimes what we say is not what people hear. Right. And what a system does is it articulates an, an instructional format. This is how it's done. And here's the example of what done looks like. And it makes it much easier for everyone because no one has to do any thinking and the brain is lazy. The brain doesn't want to try and figure out how to make something work. The brain wants to go, I do step one and then step two and then step three and four and five. And then that's it done. Move on to the next one. So, so that's the, the, the part where you're, you know, creating all the different formats and then I'm guessing it, it then 
allows the edit to put them in certain places and then i'm guessing the final stage is is the distribution part how does how does that look yeah so there's the distribution part but one cool thing about the repurposing is that uh so there's a couple of added benefits to the organization is that number one as a video comes in i automatically transcribe it so like if i do a TikTok video it transcribes it puts it into a document which then a copywriter can go through and create a text post out of it and then that can also take that text post and inject it into uh, a template that creates like those really cool looking carousels. Um, so I get two added, I get now, now, now besides just hyper organization and making people's life easier, I just created two assets that didn't exist before that now are going to like go out on LinkedIn, like pretty much like without me having to think too much about it. Um, yeah. And then because I'm super organized, everything is, like in this, so if you imagine in this system, everything is linked, the, the image, the file, uh, the media, the image, um, I have metadata around these things. I know what, what piece is done or not done. Um, I have published dates, I have titles. So when we move into this next phase, which is distribution, um, in that repurposing phase, when I applied a playbook, Part of that playbook is also where does this go? And so the system also keeps track of channels and brands. So I know like, like down to like the very, like there's the den LinkedIn page, but then you, ha you might have a company page. And so all of these playbooks are literally pushing content to these places. And so now either whether it's somebody manually posting it because the platform requires that or integrating with a, I have this, there's a platform called AirShare, which is basically a buffer dot com for yeah. people like me developers and so i can just literally from Airtable, i can just push the content i either make it really easy for someone to publish manually because they have to or i can just push it straight through on the um through one of those automated platforms and just publish the content um and nobody had to really think about it uh, so yeah. and then and then i'm also able to pull the analytics back down and because i have all this data around the stuff I can then start to compare the, the content and I can also do reporting on like how, how well is the machine actually functioning? How much content is literally going out the door? And if it's not hitting the standard that I want, I can reverse engineer it because I have the data to say, is, is the copywriting taking too long? Is the video editing taking too yeah. long? So it's, it gives me the ability to just li literally like, refine the machine because a machine like sometimes things are going in too fast some things are you know like it's not as simple as you might think no and and in terms of like i mean team size what what would you say is the the minimum size team and and what are those roles you mentioned copywriter and editor too because because your your system and, and I've seen it, so I know it's it's very involved and does a lot of automation within it. But you still need the the end, you know, the, the driver to, yeah. to to steer. I call it manning and the so, machine. Somebody has to like go. Yeah. Into the, somebody has to man it. So, so what my team looks like at this point is uh, there's me. Obviously, I do most of the recordings. Yeah. I call that the subject matter expert. Um, and then you're going to need someone that can man the machine. And that just essentially is like, just checking in on it every day, like what content is out there, what needs an image, what needs copywriting, checking in with those team members. And I, the machine also facilitates a lot of that communication through Slack. Like yeah. It just tells people what, what's outstanding. Somebody still needs to pay a little attention to that though. Um, so you're gonna need someone to do that. That's not really a that full-time job, That, but it's just a thoughtful like it's a daily commitment to it's a daily commitment to attend a 15 minute check in on the machine and then just putting out the the notices and just checking in with people um and then i i just hired on somebody and i, I define this role it's i call it content operations and this is somebody that i hired um i happen to hire this person from the philippines and they are going to be working full time 40 hours a week just pumping out videos for the most part on, on a tool called Descript, which yeah. can, people would, if you use Descript, you know what I'm talking about, you know how cool it is. But a lot of people don't realize that you can train somebody from not being an editor to a really good editor 
in not so much time. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we did. And so they're going to be able to pump out really good quality videos that will perform well on places like TikTok. Um, and they can also jump into Canva and, you know, uh, you know, make thumbnails and stuff for YouTube. They can clean up carousel stuff. So if the automation wasn't perfect, they can clean it up little things, add some post emojis to make it better, or like icons. Yeah. To do the finishing touches, right? Because automation is always going to be a little bit like automated, right? It will get you, it will be 80% of the way there. Right. So you got to have somebody come in. It slightly. Yeah. You got to have somebody come in and just like put that flare back. Um, and then I have a part time editor who does probably 20% of the video editing in Adobe to do that high grade stuff that the script just can't do. So that's how yeah. I, that's how I do it is like subject matter expert, someone to man the machine. I call it the machine architect, so to speak. Then uh, content operations full time has a variety of skills who, when I, and I, when I looked for that person, I mostly, the, the highest criteria was like, are you passionate around making content? Because I was like, if you like content and social media, you'll be able to learn these things, no doubt. Yeah, they're going to be consuming content. Therefore, they're going to be like, hey, I saw this cool thing. Let's let's try it here. Yeah, I was less concerned that they had like specific experience because I sometimes like there's a lot of old terms that get thrown around like social media manager and these. I don't even mm. like think that way. Like I don't want a social media manager. I just want good content and a system to do it. Yeah. Like I, like I, like my, my thinking is like, how do you become a media company? That's my, that's yes. the way I think. Because then, then what, what we're talking about here is, and, and this, this will seem like a big deal for someone who's not doing any content at the moment. But I think <laughs> yes. one of the things that we have to uh, preface this with is in any business, once you've got rid of the three S friends, family, and anyone foolish enough to get close enough to you, so you can pitch to, you need to go out to a wider market who are cold, who don't know who you are and don't care. Right. And there's two kind of real ways, three ways to do that. You go and you, you run the streets and you network and you shake as many hands as you possibly can, which is difficult beyond a geographical constraint. The second way is you run paid ads. And paid ads is a, it's a commitment both financially and perhaps you work with an agency and you have to, you know, test and get your offer in front of people. But once a paid ad's been delivered, it's a numbers game. You're, you're, you're looking at percentage conversions. But once that paid ad's been shown, it's kind of dead. There's no long tail. There's no lifetime value. Content is a, probably a bigger machine to set up. But right, that is, content yeah. can last for decades. Right. Yeah. I've got videos that I made back in 2012 on making a camera work that still get views every single week. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a mindset, isn't it? It's, it's it is a, a different mindset, approach yeah. to a longer term play, but to build your audience to a point. And, and what I think we've discovered is when you have an audience who really trust you, as long as you're consistent, they'll continue to trust you. And then you have this massive opportunity to expose products and services to that audience and convert them into customers. Yeah, it's a scalability thing. And like you just end up touching a lot of people over a lot a, a long period of time. And yeah, it is a mindset like, but that's why I say it's like, become like have the mindset of becoming a media company. Mm. You're an educational force. And, and partly for me, like becoming an educator, helping people and building this out for me is a lot more fun than having a networking plan. Like, yeah, like, and it's a lot more scalable. Um, and it's a lot more fun than ads because ads, you're constantly pulling your hair out going, okay, what can we change to try and get a percentage point difference in engagement and result? But I think as, as Sam said to us during the mastermind, he said, you know, running ads is like you're scrolling through your feed and someone interrupts you to try and sell you something. Whereas with content, you're scrolling through your feed and you see some content which you find helpful, interesting, engaging. So you scroll and you watch it. You're actually you're actually not interrupting someone's reason for being there. Exactly. And and it's it's something that I'm fascinated by. Because I actually I enjoy creating content way more than I do writing ads or or, or networking. Yeah, I mean I think that's the thing, is like we're like we're all kind of creators in a way we have these ideas. Um, and that's the way I look at it too, is like, I was just like, this is going to be more fun. Um, 
And so like what I tell other people is like, luckily I had, luckily I just was like, if somebody, if I see that person doing it, I know I can do it. Yeah. And I, and I just went with it. So what I tell people is just like, have a belief that this will work and just really go for it. Uh, Cause it is the best way to build your business. And if you have the right mindset, if you think long-term, you will get short-term benefits. Uh, and something that I've found, and we didn't talk about this last week, but it, when it comes to TikTok, you've had some pretty insane numbers yeah. watching your TikToks. Yeah. I mean, talk to me about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I've had, you know, videos that have three, 400,000 or 300,000 views and, and that's actually low for TikTok. So like, you know, people that are really experienced with TikTok, like, oh, that's it, you know, like, but to me, I was like, that's a lot. And so, and I, and I, I get large numbers on a variety of types of videos, like even from like podcast clips and stuff, it's all just that, that art and how you clip up the clip. Like, can you yeah. pull the context? Can you pull the value? Can you pull the energy into these clips? And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, and I, you know, I have like 34,000 followers or something like that. And, uh, the best thing about it is just like the people that do follow me and interact with me, they're just, they're, we're very aligned, you know? And I, you know, and I can tell because I also have a lot of people on there that'd be like, whoa, like that, what you're doing is crazy. That's overwhelming. I would never do that. That's ridiculous. So when you, when you start to see that polarizing kind of behavior, I think that's actually a really good sign on social media because you know, now that like you, it's hard to stand out if you're not saying something polarizing. Yes. And I don't you mean, know. Friend. Yeah. And sorry. And, and I don't mean like contra, I, I mean, I guess controversial, but like polarizing just means you have a stance, right? Because if, if you go out and you copy what other people are saying, like that's the fastest way to blend in. Like you have to be the elephant in the room to have a good marketing positioning. A friend of mine, um, a friend of my wife's actually is married to the chairman of Saatchi and Saatchi in London. And um, we were together sometime having, having lunch and we were talking about Twitter and this was probably 10 years ago. And we, I had more Twitter followers than him and he was, we were having a bit of kind of fun with it. And I said, oh, I just, I can't really figure it out Twitter. And he said, then just take a stance. Yeah. It's good to polarize people. And, and I think that's something that really stuck with me when you do take a stance. And I think it's, it's a balance, but you don't need to be a shock jock, but no. you can take a stance and that will create a, a nice balance of people who love what you're saying and people who disagree with what you're saying. And I think that, as you say, makes you stand out and, and something that, um, you know, for the, for the filmmaking world, you know, I, I don't want people watching this or listening to this to think they've got to suddenly become this like shock jock DJ and like, you know, no. controvert, create controversy, but it's, it's like your way of doing things may not be the standard way, but if you're willing to stand up and talk about it, you'll find people who will be really drawn to you and you'll repel others. And, and that's really healthy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think you are, most people already have it. They already have the topic, but they probably, when they go to talk about it, they soften it or they dilute mm. it because they haven't seen somebody else say it so that they're not, they don't feel validated yet. Uh, so you already have it. Just say what's on your mind, like without yeah. the filter. Because you probably yeah. already have a lot of those ideas. Definitely. Stephen, this is so, so interesting. This is fun. Um, man. Where, where, you know, we talked a bit about the platform that you've created. Um, how can people connect with you? What's the best way for them to do that if they want to learn more about that? Yeah, so you can check me out on YouTube or TikTok. And if you, if you go to google.com and you just type Stephen with a P-H-G, P-O-P-E, I'm pretty sure my TikTok and my YouTube will pop up. That's the best way to just like get a bunch more content about the stuff we're talking about. Like quite literally, I'm like showing people how to build these frameworks and the technology. And then from there, if you, if you really want to talk with me, you can either drop a comment on the content. I, I respond myself. Or if you're like, this is, I want to actually talk to you. There's a place that you could from either one of those channels to like book a call and we can chat and, and, uh, talk about like if it makes sense to to work together or not that's very very cool well, mate it was it was an absolute pleasure meeting you at that event yeah i was glad, glad we, we did connected. and and this is awesome and i'd love to come back and revisit this because i think i think this is a topic that's not going to go away 
is only going to evolve. And you're you're like the Gary V of this of this <laughs> of this genre. So uh, I feel very fortunate that we get a chance to to tap in and ask you things directly. Well, I appreciate that, and I, I and as a um, as a testament to how content works is that I, like the fact that you say that means that the content can work, right? Because like I'm going down a path and uh, people are starting to say those things. Like when you hear people repeating back to you the things that you're saying, you know that it's sticking. And that's why, like you mentioned, the keeping to your pillars, um, that's important because if you talk about everything, people won't know how to identify you. Well, guys, I hope you found that really helpful. Now, if you want to watch the first part of this interview with Stephen, just go and click on this link here and you can watch that right now. Please always subscribe, tell your friends. I'll see you in the next one.